Awesome. Welcome along, everyone, to our live tonight. Now, I'm just going to wait a couple of seconds to make sure that this has all pushed through to you all. But for those of you joining us, let us know where you are tuning in from. Now, very shortly, I'll do some official welcomes, and you can see that I've got Christy with me on the screen here as well. So thanks so much for tuning in. It might be early morning for you if you're over in the UK or the Northern Hemisphere or evening if you're in Australia, New Zealand with us. So yeah, while we just um, give everyone a minute or two to roll on in, please do let us know in the comments where you're tuning in from, um, what industry you're working in at the moment as well. And we are really keen to make this conversation as interactive as possible. So if you do have questions for Christy as we're going, do ask them in the chat and I'll be keeping an eye on them. If you see me look down, I'll be checking them out right there. So, so definitely, yeah, definitely get active in the, in the comments. So I think we'll kick straight into it as we've got 30 minutes and I want to give Christy as much airtime as possible. But just before I pass over to her, so... For those who don't know me, my name is Lou Court and I am the social media specialist here at Timely. So I'm the one that is responsible for communicating our Timely's brand, our awesome brand to you, our beautiful online community. So you might recognize me from some of the bootcamp classes or hit classes, a few Insta Lives we've been doing. Um, and tonight, I am absolutely delighted to be joined by this lovely lady you see right beside me, Christy Von Linden. So thanks so much for joining us tonight, Christy. Pleasure. Great to be here. Awesome. So Christy is the founder of Mind Bright. Now Mind Bright is based in Auckland and Christy is an accredited mindfulness teacher for adults and children. She is a resilience facilitator and an experienced researcher with a passion for neuroscience and psychology. So it was actually her former former corporate management job and, run, and her personal running injury that led her to switch careers. So Christy has experienced firsthand the stresses and pressures of the modern workplace. So she is very, you know, knows, knows what a lot of us are going through. So it's awesome to have her here with us tonight to, to give us a bunch of advice on how to deal with the stresses that everyone's going through. So today Christy spends her days educating um, organizations driving positive change for workplace culture and employee self-care so not only do we have christy here to inspire you with her wellness habits but she also has very kindly put together a presentation for us all so we will share that in just a second and please do um, get yourself set up grab a pen and paper also if you've got your phone handy and you'd like to take photos of the slides you're more than welcome to do that today um, we're going to have some awesome tips that you can take away and actually put into action. So if you are all set, let's, let's get started. Great. Okay, I'm going to start by sharing my screen with you all. Just make sure you can see that okay. Perfect. Coming through great. Nice. Fantastic. Okay, cool. So as Lou said, let's make this interactive and um, feel free to pop any questions that come up as I'm chatting in the chat and Lou will ask them to me. So I've called this short workshop from surviving to thriving because I think a lot of us are in survival mode at the moment. It's been such a crazy um, year so far and it's taken a huge toll on our health mostly a mental and emotional, um, which is completely understandable. We've never really um, been faced with the challenges and the uncertainty um, that we're all going through right now. And this is on top of the fact that, you know, the research shows that the 21st century is already an era that is particularly stressful for our brains. And so, you know, throw COVID and this pandemic on top of this, and our brains are really struggling to cope. Um, the, the load is really huge, the mental and emotional load. So what we want to look at tonight is really how can we start to thrive again? Um, because when we're stressed, what we know about the brain is that we can't thrive. And what that means is that our relationships, our career, and our mental, physical, and emotional health is not going to reach its potential. So we really want to foster that sense of well-being, and that's, that's what we do when we're thriving. So to get our first clue into how we can actually thrive, um, it can be really helpful to look at what stress is, where it comes from, and how we can reduce it. 
um, so that we can start to work with our brain's natural wiring and start to build our resilience in spite of all the challenges we're going through right now. So looking at the science of stress, and don't worry, I'm not going to have anything um, too neuroscience-y for you tonight. We'll keep it nice and straightforward. But it can be really helpful to understand stress and really to do that, we need to turn back in time to look at how our brains have evolved. And so let's start by looking at where does stress actually come from? Well, stress starts in our brains, a part of our brain called the amygdala. Um, and you may have actually heard of the amygdala referred to as our lizard brain or our reptilian brain. And that's because as the theory of evolution goes, we've evolved from very simple creatures such as lizards and reptiles to the more complex life forms that we are today. And so interestingly, that lizard brain or the amygdala, which sits here at the base of our neck, we still have that exact same lizard brain today. We've just evolved with a few more brains, including our prefrontal cortex, which is where we do all our higher intellectual thinking. So when lizard brain was alive, it obviously lived in much more simple, yet much more dangerous times in terms of pred predators. And lizard's brain's job was really to keep um, lizard alive to ensure the survival and the continuation of the species. And so in order to do this, it had one job. It had to be constantly scanning its environment for either signs of safety or signs of danger. So danger being predators. So when it sensed safety, it would activate a system in our body called uh, rest and digest, or it's now known as rest, digest, repair and reproduce. And this is when we feel nice and relaxed. Uh, and when it sensed danger, it activated a system in our body by communicating down the um, spinal cord to the nervous system called fight or flight. And I'm sure many of you are familiar with the fight or flight mode. Essentially what happens when it activates fight or flight from our brain is that it gives our body enough energy to fight or run from a predator. Okay. And so Fast forward a few hundred million years, and we've now evolved into the much more complex life forms that we are today, humans. Our brains are now 50,000 times more intelligent than a computer, yet we still have that ancient amygdala lizard brain, and it still thinks it has a job to do, which is to protect us and to keep us safe. And it will always err on the side of caution. And so because most of us don't have predators for it to look out for these days, um, we're all living in obviously much more complex yet much safer times. It's now decided to, um, I guess, make up some new things that might be threatening to us. So whereas when it was a lizard brain, it used to look out for things that were scarce. So scarcity of shelter, scarcity of water, scarcity of food and warmth and things that were scary. So predators, for example, it's now decided to make up some new things. Well, things that are very threatening to us, but they're not physically threatening. So we don't actually need that fight or flight response. So some of the things that are scarce now are scarcity of time, scarcity of love, scarcity of money, and particularly now with COVID, scarcity of knowledge or knowing or control. Um, and things that are scary have now become, you know, maybe running late, being stuck in a meeting, um, financial worries, a full inbox, a big to-do list. And of course, I've been chatting with the girls at Timely about some of the stressful things that you guys are going through now. Um, I know that you're going through, you know, concerns and fears around laying off staff, grumpy customers that you might be having to reschedule, juggling kids and work at home um, during lockdown, something I'm very familiar with, with a, with a daughter at home, and also maybe worrying about the, the future of the industry. These are very real and, you know, valid concerns. But the problem is our brain hasn't quite evolved to catch up to understand the difference between a very real physical threat and a psychological threat. So what that means is tiger crashing through the jungle about to eat you, fight or flight response engaged, stuck in traffic, running late for a meeting, worried about lockdown or catching COVID or financial worries or the future of the industry, fight or flight response engaged. So fight or flight itself is not the problem. We're actually, you know, our bodies are designed to go into this emergency response. The issue that we're facing now is how many times we're going into fight or flight. So experts theorize that our cavemen ancestors would have gone into the fight or flight response maybe about once a week or once a fortnight at most when a predator came or maybe another tribe member, they got into a fight. 
But these days, as you can imagine, many of us are going into this fight or flight response all throughout the day and all throughout the week. And this is actually the real, the, the real issue that's starting to wear down our emotional health, our mental health, and actually our physical health as well. Because fight or, the fight or flight response, um, when that's activated, has to engage and disengage all sorts of systems in our body, like our brain, our digestion, our immune system. Um, and these all start to get worn down when we're constantly going into fight or flight. I've just, um, I've just asked the audience as well to let us know if there are any sort of fears that they've found through the, this, you know, last six months that have been um, more pressing. And also, I think when we're talking about, you know, what, what the people in our industries are going through at the moment, like a lot of the stresses are coming from, let's say, like you've sort of mentioned there around, um, running costs of businesses. So, you know, um, yeah, your, your finances, which would might be like your rent for your salon, internet power, things like that, if you're not actually getting a full calendar and even that side of things like your bookings and if you're actually getting appointments into the calendar. And then there's sort of a whole nother side to it where it's for the areas that are still shut at the moment even you know the the fear of not being around people and missing the clients and the craft and even the you know the staff and so on so i think there's quite there's definitely quite a few things and it would be awesome yeah to hear from hear from you and the audience around what it is that you're going through at the moment if there are things that you can identify that put you into this fight or flight state and I really want to stress that all of these concerns that you've brought up are completely 100%, you know, justified and relevant and understandable. Um, that's not to say that we shouldn't be getting stressed about these things. They're absolutely very, very, very real and very stressful. Um, the issue is that we don't need that physical fight or flight response for, to, you know, to cope with those. So I've got some good strategies that we're going to go through in the talk tonight um, to help you understand better, um, you know, a better way to deal with them that's not going to start to wear down all the systems and make you feel exhausted by the end of the day. Because it, when we go into that fight or flight response, it's very physical and it takes a huge toll on our body, all, that, all the energy producing all those stress hormones and, um, and getting all that extra energy for the fight or flight. So that's why a lot of us are feeling very fatigued at the moment as well. So right. yeah, we'll absolutely okay. go through them. And I think, you know, our emergency response was designed for acutely stressful situations, but the situations were very short-lived. They were like natural disasters, you know, tornadoes, tsunamis, um, you know, dealing with a predator. Um, whereas this pandemic that we're dealing with is not a short issue. Yeah. It's, you know, it's, in, it's indefinite at the moment. We don't know when it's going to end. Um, and so I think that's why a lot of us are feeling so exhausted and so over it because we're just sort of not designed to be in fight or flight mode um, for this long. Yeah. So, are there, Sorry, I was just going to ask a question on it and you might be covering this shortly, but in terms of um, some of the things that people to identify if we're going into fight or flight, what would be some of those, let's say, first warning signs or signals that that's happening for us? Yeah, that's a great question, Lou, actually. So... There are lots of different ones and different people will notice different things, but some of the really common ones are physically uh, noticing that your heart's racing really fast. Um, you might get sweaty palms. You might start to feel your shoulders tensing up around your neck and feel sore neck and shoulders. Some people get headaches. Some people get tingling. Um, a lot of people get tummy issues, like maybe feel sick or get a sore tummy. And that's because basically when we go into fight or flight, our digestion gets shut off. Um, to divide and all the blood gets diverted away from the tummy and into our arms and legs for the physical fight or flight. Um, so those are the physical signs to look out for. You might also notice trembling and that's because your muscles are tensing up for the fight. Crazy. Um, and then, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It's all, you know, stuff that we just don't need when we're trying to work yeah. through like in a crazy email or something. Yeah, when we're inside <laughs> our safe home. Exactly. But yeah, it's the body's still so, so trained to yeah to and we just haven't quite evolved our brains haven't yeah. quite evolved to catch up yet and then um what some people notice mentally is that that feeling of oh, i just can't think straight or they might find they're really snappy and emotional mm -hmm. um and so that's another sign of fight or flight and the reason for that is when we go into fight or flight our prefrontal cortex which is where we do all of our higher intellectual thinking 
problem solving, decision making, memory, learning, communication, empathy, that actually goes offline. And that's because that part of our brain is very energy hungry. And so our, our amygdala lizard brain is trying to save energy for the fight or flight by switching that off. So again, you know, some of the things I'm going to talk you through will really help us switch that fight or flight response off so we can bring our um, rational thinking back online and start to deal with some of these problems that we have. Awesome. So yeah, great, great point and definitely great to get really in tune and aware with your body and notice like, what are my warning signals mm. when I'm feeling like I'm in fight or flight? So it can be helpful to think of stress in terms of safety and danger in the brain. The this, this safety and danger model. And when our brain's feeling safe, um, we'll be activating that rest and digest response. And this is where we want to be spending most of our day. This is where we're designed to be spending most of our time. We're not designed to be spending most of our time in fight or flight. When we're in rest and digest, obviously, as it says, we're able to rest, we're able to digest our food and nutrients, but there's so much more. It's when we're able to actually fully access all parts of our brain, our relationships will flow, we'll feel happy, our brain will prioritize positive emotions, um, and we actually heal and boost our immune system in this place as well. So we want to be here while this virus is going around because uh, oh, yeah. our immune system also gets um, compromised when we're in fight or flight. Like physically and mentally, so, so important. Yeah. Yeah. But the, the problem is that whatever we practice, um, our brains get better at because we've got plastic brains or they call it neuroplasticity. What that means basically is that our brains are constantly changing and adapting and whatever where our energy flows, um, you know, the neural pathways grow, we just get better at it. So if we're practicing the fight or flight response a lot, we just get better and better at it. And you can actually rewire your brain in about eight weeks and change your nervous system's default setting to fight or flight. And that's what happened to me in my corporate job when I burnt out through chronic pain and anxiety. And what that meant is I was actually then waking up in the morning feeling anxious without any triggers at all for no reason. I just felt constantly in danger. And so the good news is don't worry about that because what we know from this brain's plasticity is that we can actually flip it and change it back so that we feel safe as our base. Um, and I'm gonna go through some things that you can do to help build that safety, balance of safety in the brain and build your resilience now. Eight weeks I feel like is also such a, a doable chunk of time to put in the effort to practice something to turn it into more of a more of a habit or more of a natural response like uh, that's it, it's such a nice achievable amount of time to actually have changes start to happen yeah. and you can notice changes straight away to your nervous system by using some of these practices that i'm about to talk through so um but yeah in the bigger picture you can actually completely reset your brain which is and make physical changes yeah. in your brain which is so amazing yes brilliant <laughs> So we're going to look at um, three really quick strategies to build resilience, okay? And when we talk about resilience, really what we're talking about is um, when it comes to adversity, such as what we're all going through right now, how well can we cope or adapt or bounce back? And what you'll find is that some people are actually just naturally more resilient than others. Um, but the good news is we can cultivate resilience through these practices. So probably the most important one is we need to learn how to switch fight or flight off. So I wanna illustrate what I mean by giving you an example of how animals cope with stress. <laughs> so I want you to cast your mind back to, I'm sure you've probably all watched a nature documentary like David Attenborough, one of his ones on National Geographic, for example, where there's maybe a bunch of gazelles gracefully grazing in a paddock, eating their lunch, and then all of a sudden you get a wide shot and you might see a lion coming in the corner and all of a sudden within a split second they activate fight or flight, they flee, they flight. And um, then when they realize one of their you know, herd has been caught and they're not going to be lunch um, that day, within a few minutes you'll see them return to peacefully eating their lunch. Now for most of us, if we were in our workspace, a salon or an office and a tiger came in and ate one of our colleagues, do you think we'd all be thinking about our muffin and coffee break within 15 minutes? <laughs> probably not. We'd probably all be um, getting treated for post-traumatic stress disorder for the next few months or even years. So this illustrates that, you know, the difference between humans and animals. Animals, once the danger has gone, their fight or flight switches off. But when it comes to humans, unfortunately, our thinking alone is enough to keep our fight or flight response switched on. 
And so long after the actual danger has passed, just by mulling over it and worrying, which is very natural for our brains, we actually keep that fight or flight response switched on. So we really need to practice switching it off um, regularly and we'll get much better at it. Because as I'm sure you guys are all aware, it's actually really, really hard to just think your way out of stress. Um, we can't you know, turn off the stress response um, using our brains. We actually need to you know, override our evolutionary history, you know, years um, of this you know, mode that has been created to keep us safe. Um, and so these are some of the systems in the body that actually override the fight or flight response. So these are all very science-based. I was just so, going to say, sorry, on that, on that one as well, like it, it just um, gets me thinking about, you know, I, I'm sure that so many people out here will have experienced this where you've had a client come in and they haven't been in a good mood and it hasn't been the nicest experience. And it's so hard to kick that after you've gone through that experience and I think yeah you're right that there'll be so many situations you know where something like that happens and it does linger that feeling so does linger so obviously we talk about a lion but it can be such day-to-day -day things eh? and that comes back to I guess the the things that are getting us into that fight or flight mode yeah lions are clients and bad yeah. emails and yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or partners you sometimes and children and sometimes <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Partners sometimes. yeah. all sorts yeah. i mean honestly I'm, i've i've worked with lots of people over these you know lockdowns and you know i just really want to stress how normal it is for you to be feeling much more stressed and much more emotional than normal um it's very very common at the moment for people to be not coping um, myself included, I've had some massive big emotions, uncomfortable emotions during the couple of lockdowns we've had here in Auckland trying to keep on top of everything. So really, really normal. Um, but these are some of the things that can really help. And so as I mentioned, because the fight or flight response is very much not using this, it's got nothing to do with our thinking brain. We can't use our thinking brain to get out of it. We have to go to our body to get out of it, okay? So one of the best ways science knows to switch off the fight or flight response is 15 slow, deep belly breaths. So as part of the fight or flight response, what happens is our breathing comes up into our chest and it becomes shallow and fast. And this is all part of that fight or flight response. And when we're breathing up here, it doesn't feel very good. Um, it limits oxygen up to our brain and it makes us feel really tense and really stressed and it makes us feel emotional too. So what we know is that when we actually change our breath, notice that we're breathing in our chest, that's a sign you're in fight or flight too actually, and redirect the breath back down to the belly and do long, slow breaths, they reckon about 15 times, really focusing on extending the exhale and relaxing all your muscles on the exhale. This actually overrides the stress response, communicates directly with that lizard brain and sends a signal that we're safe and mm -hmm. it will um, override the production of those stress hormones and return us back to rest and digest. So it seems almost too simple, but it really <laughs> is one of the quickest, most powerful ways. And I'm sure you've all heard that saying when things are getting stressful, just take a deep breath. Well, they're onto something, it really works. Um, and so a great thing to do is actually practice breathing like this outside of when you're feeling stressed so that it's easier for you because although breathing should be second nature a lot of us have gotten to a really bad habit of um, chest breathing mm -hmm. and actually even holding our breath when we get stressed and so you kind of need to practice um, so if you want to practice you just basically put one hand on your chest and one hand on your belly and you want to when you're breathing and not be moving the hand on your chest some people who have gotten a really bad pattern of thoracic breathing or chest breathing find this quite difficult and so it can be really good to lie down and you'll find it easier to access that breath and a really good way to um, practice is just do 10 breaths when you wake up and 10 breaths when you go to bed and by doing that proactively you'll be sending those safety messages to your brain which helps balance your nervous system and wearing um clothing that's not too tight yes high-waisted jeans and not oh, my jeans are high, i'm very high-waisted high -waisted high -waisted right now <laughs> undo them while you're at your desk <laughs> yeah, nice nice awesome so the next um, tip also seems really simple, but it's movement. So the reason that movement is so, so important is that the fight or flight is actually designed to be followed by a short, intense burst of activity. That's why, you know, our cavemen ancestors would have actually fought, which was physical, or run back into the cave, which was physical. And that running 
or fighting, that physical activity burns off those stress hormones and also burns off that extra energy that you've created to go into the fight or flight. But unfortunately, what happens for most of us when we're in that stress response is we're sitting down at our desks or we're not really moving, we're quite stationary. And um, this really keeps those um, stress hormones swimming around, making us feel edgy and anxious. Now, the great news is you don't need to go for like a half an hour run to burn off those stress hormones and return to homeostasis. You just need five minutes of intense physical activity that gets wow. your heart rate up. So okay. you could, you know, worst case scenario, you could go into the bathroom and do star jumps for a few minutes <laughs> um, and get your heart rate up. And that will actually, you know, switch off the fight or flight response. Or you could walk around the block really swinging your arms. So again, it doesn't need to be much. Uh -huh. I'm trying to come up with practical things that you can do during your work day as well. That's such a nice thing to hear that it actually, like 15 breaths is not, you know, it's not much. It's so achievable. And five minutes of exercise, like you're always going to be able to spare that in your day. It's like a toilet break or whatever it might be. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Just putting a little poster or reminder somewhere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to yeah. get the habit of it. And then the last one, again, um, seems simple, but it's connecting with family and friends. And research really shows that, um, you know, our connections, our social connections and relationships are one of the biggest protector um, for our mental and emotional health. And it can be something so simple, like a hug when you're feeling in fight or flight response, talking to someone that you care about and trust when you're in the fight or flight response. Or this seems really odd, but um, when we're all feeling so depleted, but actually doing something kind for something else, like a, like a, um, a random act of kindness or a small gesture, even when you're feeling depleted yourself. Now, the reason that all of these things help is they release a lovely hormone, which you may have heard of called oxytocin, when we're connecting um, with others. And oxytocin is the love hormone, but we also get it um, just when we're connecting with friends and family and colleagues and clients as well. Um, in a positive way. And this oxytocin cancels out cortisol. It overrides it, which is the stress hormone. Um, and that's, that goes again back to our evolution. We're wired to be connected to those around us and it creates a sense of psychological safety. Mm. Um, so those are three very quick tips to switch off the fight or flight response. We've, um, we've just had a question come through on, on what we've just been running through as well. Um, Nicola has asked us, do the same strategies that we're talking about here for ourselves or for clients work for children as well? Yeah, 100%. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. I've got a little four-year-old and um, I find the belly breathing one really, really great. Again, with kids, you obviously just want to keep it as simple as possible. But yeah, we're all wired. Our brains are all designed and wired exactly the same. Um, it's just you can kind of approach some things differently. But the movement one's a great one for kids. Mm -hmm. Like if they're getting stressed or grumpy, you can get them dancing for five minutes or jumping up and down yeah. out in nature. But the breathing one, I put a teddy bear on my daughter's belly and get her to um, lift it up oh, and down, which is really nice. cute. Um, yeah. and getting, getting her to do like gratitude or to, you know um, give me a hug you know of course we mm. know that hugging our children calms their stress response so great mm. question and I feel like um, you know a lot of people as well being at home at the moment in certain places like where I am Melbourne or Victoria and Australia um, having young ones at home while still trying to work on their business having a few skills like this up their sleeves is is going to be amazing so it's awesome Definitely. And there's so many amazing resources on, I'd recommend on mindfulness for children. Um, just look on YouTube and Google. Um, there's lots of ideas out there and books out there as well. So the second tip is that we, so I've given you a tip for when, you know, to be reactive when you're in fight or flight, but how can we actually be proactive and guard ourselves against stress and make ourselves more resilient? So what we want to do is proactively spend more time cultivating safety. So really what that means is just doing things that we enjoy, that make us feel happy, because this will make our brain feel safe. And the sad thing is that when we're stressed, these are the things that are first to go off our to-do list, but this is when we need them more than ever. Um, and I've got some examples here, and you know, really what the research shows is that we need to be cultivating um, a relaxation practice and prioritizing time for our brain to feel safe and relaxed every single day. Um, whereas most of us kind of save the stuff for the weekend, but it's not enough. Um, it's what we do little and often every single day that makes the biggest difference to our brain and nervous system and how the balance of safety and danger. 
So going to yoga once a week or going on holiday once every three months is not enough to protect your stress levels. You need to be just doing little things. Some of them only need to take a few minutes, but about 30 minutes of relaxation a day, which I feel is achievable for most of us, even parents, you know, being a parent myself um, mm. and working full time. So some examples are sport, exercise, dancing, music is fantastic, playing a musical instrument, even listening to music. Time in nature and outdoors is really great for our nervous system. Anything to do with water, so swimming or having a bath, watching a comedy where you're laughing, quality time with loved ones, playing with animals or children, kindness, massage, meditation and mindfulness, um, prayer or spiritual practice, your favorite hobby, so it could be cooking or anything like art, painting, crafts, um, gardening even. In fact, mindful coloring is a really great one as well. And really importantly, time off digital devices and news because for most of us, our fight or flight response is being triggered every time we're on our phones and looking at the news. Um, so it's really, really important that we have time away from that to protect our brains. So what all of these have in common, you might've noticed, is that they're all getting back into our bodies and out of our thinking brains. They're all re-engaging our senses. And that's one of the biggest problems we have in the 21st century is we're just overusing our thinking brains um, and we need to just get back into our bodies and back into nature and back into our senses. So um, take a screenshot of this, just figure out what it is for you and um, try and commit to just one thing a day. I was just going to add on to that as well. I was, you've said it already. I was going to say, people, please do screen grab this because it's so nice to have a bit of um, inspiration on what you can turn to. And I think one of the biggest things for, for me personally is actually putting value on these activities because for me it sort of feels like they're things that I'm doing for me and it's quite easy to disregard them and let them go um, and be pushed to the side when something else you know whether it's work or you're doing something for someone else um, but I think really and hearing what you're saying with the importance of them and that it does need to be a regular um, activity or practice I think yeah actually putting the value on these types of activities and even scheduling that yeah, definitely the day the way you would a, a meeting sometimes sometimes is is some you know you feel like you shouldn't need to do that but sometimes it actually just helps make you commit to something like this yeah, yeah. that's a great point i always like when i'm planning my work day i'm like meditation or going yeah. for a walk in the bush or <laughs> how am i gonna fit that in and because I've done, you know, so much research into the brain, I know that when I do these things, I actually am better at my job anyway. And I'm a better yeah. mum and a better partner and a better boss. You know, like, it just makes sense. It actually, you get more done in less time when you're not exhausting your brain and constantly in fight or flight. So it will save you time and make Business you Business tips, eh? Hey? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, I love it. This is awesome. Cool. And then the last one um, is beating our negativity bias with gratitude. So um, you may or may not be aware, but our brains are actually wired to see the world in, with a negative bias. That means we see things naturally more negatively than positively. Um, so, and it also means that we ignore or forget the positive and pay more attention to the negative. So um, an example might be, I don't know if you've ever had um, like a work review um, and you get, you know, 15 pieces of amazing feedback and one piece of constructive feedback and what's the thing that you focus on you totally ignore all the good stuff and you just focus on that one thing um, so you know how our brain processes positive information is it flows straight in and straight out the brain so it makes it harder to notice and harder to remember whereas negative um, experiences flow in the brain our amygdala notices them it stresses and reacts and release, has a physiological response with the release of stress hormones and then it locks it into our nervous system memory and then our brain constantly looks out for it happening next time. So it's a much more complex process. And so, you know, the reason that our brain is designed like this it goes back to our evolution again back in the cavemen days so that if we, for example, heard rustling in the bushes, we were much more likely to think, oh, that's a predator. Um, and do something to get ourselves to safety rather than, oh, that's someone coming to bring me lunch or a present. <laughs> um, because that positive thinking wouldn't have kept us safe and alive. But obviously it's not so helpful today and it causes a lot of mindless sort of stress and worry and we don't see things as they, as they are. So, you know, one way that research has found that we can overcome this negative bias, which causes us to feel, you know, quite down about the world and quite pessimistic, um, and causes anxiety and stress 
is to practice gratitude. So um, really just making time in our days and weeks to um, think about what it is in our lives that we've been grateful for. And really it's just a way of cultivating and putting aside time to notice the good because our brains don't notice it. So we almost have to make time for it um, to sit there and consciously think about it. And um, what research has shown is you, it doesn't need to be much. Uh, it doesn't even need to be every day, just three to five times a week. Um, writing down, you know, a couple of things that you're grateful for, thankful for, could be people, could be experiences, could be things. Um, and, you know, I just want to say that by practicing gratitude, it doesn't mean that we're ignoring all the hardships um, because we're all going through a lot right now. It's just really, and when we're not trying to silver line it and make it better than it is, I think it's really important from a mindfulness perspective that we accept and have compassion for all the hard stuff we're going through. But it's just really shifting the focus momentarily. Um, so that we can help our brain be more balanced in how it sees things and, and notice the positive as well. So I really want to challenge everyone um, after this is finished tonight to just take some time and maybe write down um, a couple of things that you're grateful for and handwriting is much better. It makes the brain notice it more than saying it out loud, for example. I think there were, this might have even been actually when I, um, when I came to one of your workshops, I, I think it may have been you that told me this, but um, something that I've been trying to do is write it on when I'm in the shower on oh, the glass. Shower. Yeah, yeah. And it's so good because it's so, you're not doing anything else while you're in there, you know. And and that has been that's been really really good and actually turning turning that into a little bit of a habit. And in a way, you're still sort of writing that writing it down. Yeah, as no, it's, yeah. yeah, they would have written by hand back in the cavemen days, yeah, not pen. So that's perfect. Yeah. yeah. So while your conditioner sets writing in the shower wall in the steam, yeah. That's yeah, how I turned yeah. it into a habit. And um, then it doesn't, you know, because we're all so busy. So if you can multitask. Yeah. It doesn't feel like it's, you're, ta you're taking, any, it's taking up any time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep, fantastic. So yeah, that brings us, I don't want to overwhelm you with information because stress is a huge topic, but um, hopefully there's some good stuff there to really help you to come up with a little bit of a plan. Like I would sit down after this and have a think about those things and maybe, yeah, as you said, pop some stuff in your calendar, have a think about when you might like to do um, practice gratitude and um, just really start practicing that diaphragmatic breathing or movement or connecting with others every time you notice you're in fight or flight to switch it off so that you don't suffer the effects of feeling stressed longer than you need to. Mm, awesome. I do have um, a question that has come through as well for you, just around, um, do you have any self-help or meditation apps specifically, or even podcasts that you could recommend? And I can also share them in the chat for people that are here. Yeah, absolutely. There's so many good ones. So probably my favorite one is um, by a couple of Oxford University professors in England called um, Mindfulness, Finding Peace in a Frantic World. The reason I like this is it's steeped in research, um, but also it's actually an eight-week program specifically designed to rewire your brain to overcome stress and anxiety and depression. Um, and it, takes, it has an app that goes with a book, uh, but you can just get the app and it takes you through a different meditation every week. Um, so that's a great one. And then I really love Calm. It's also great. And also Insight Timer has loads of amazing free meditations as well. Awesome. I'm just sharing those there. Now the first one, Mindfulness, Finding Peace in a... Frantic World. World. Awesome. Not, not the easiest title. But <laughs> no, no, sorry. I was um, listening to you too much to actually be yeah. that. And while you're doing that, I'll just say that... Um, you know, meditating is a wonderful way to switch off the fight or flight response as well. So you can do a couple of minutes or 15 minutes and it will shift you from fight or flight into rest and digest. So um, I've, you know, I, in my corporate job, when I got into meditation, I sometimes, if I had a stressful day, would go down into my car in the basement and meditate so, or into the park and just have headphones. You know, you really can do it anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Oh, this has been so brilliant. It's, it's been awesome. And we've had some lovely comments come through as well from, um, we've, I've just asked people if they can share a few things of what they're grateful for today. And we've had, Nicola has commented, health, family, and level two, a, being able to work again. So that is awesome. Cool. Awesome. Now, is that our presentation? Are we? Oh, stop sharing that. Awesome. Just so we can see your beautiful face. <laughs> 
So thanks so much to everyone that has joined us tonight or this morning, depending on where you are. It's been, it's been awesome. And hopefully you've had some really nice digestible um, pieces of advice that you can take away and action. And what we will do as well, it sometimes can be quite hard to take everything on board that first time when you're listening to it. So we'll post this as soon as we've finished with the live and you can come back and um, re-watch it, take your notes. And also I just wanted to, before we let you go, Christy, um, if you could let people know where they can find you if they're keen to follow you on socials or check you out on your website. Yeah, great. You can follow me on Instagram. So I'm just mind underscore bright underscore and I do lots of sort of daily science-based tips um, to help with stress, anxiety, make you happier, help you perform better in the workplace, and also Mind Bright on um, Facebook as well. Awesome. And I will just post those right now for everyone if they would like to follow a lot along. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been brilliant. And I feel like the, the tips that you've shared um, are going to be really great bits of practical advice that people can go away in action um, moving forward from here. So thank you. And I know it's quite late in New Zealand. So thanks again for the time. It's been You're welcome. Awesome. All Be right. kind to your minds, everyone. <laughs> yes, please. Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And hopefully we'll catch you all again very shortly. Bye.